Uh, my name is Amin Saikal, Director of the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies at the Australian National University. With me I have uh, the Honourable Hamid Ansari, the former Vice President of India, uh, a very d distinguished uh, uh, diplomat as well as a scholar and of course uh, with a very uh, uh, credible uh, public service uh, career behind him. Uh, Mr Ansari, welcome to the ANU uh, uh, Media. Thank you, Amin. Th thank you for being here. Given that you have had a very uh, colorful and eventful uh, career, uh, how do you think that the world has changed during your time? Well, I am a man of the last century, considering that uh, I finished my university in 1959-60. I started my diplomatic service in 1961 and finished in 1999 and thereafter I have done so many other things. So I can really talk about uh, more about the last century and partially about the first decade and a half of this century. And how do you think that the world has really changed you know from the 20th century uh, to the beginning of the 21st century? How are we really witnessing a big shift from the, or power shift for that matter, uh, from the west to the east? Well, firstly, the world has changed in the technological sense, which is most, most obvious and visible. Whether thought patterns have kept pace with the technological change, I am not so, uh, so sure. And I am constantly reminded of what uh, the philosopher Hegel said that the owl of Minerva begins to fly only with the falling of the dusk. Mm -hmm. Well, the owl of Minerva hasn't quite started flying yet. Mm -hmm. And as we have seen over the last uh, 15, 18 years of the present century, human wisdom in greater measure could have done things in a very different way and would have saved a great deal of uh, misery. So, but uh, do you see a dramatic shift from the West to, to the East in terms of power politics as well as uh, overall uh, balance of power? Oh, the shift had started much earlier. The shift mm. had started really with the decolonization process, mm. the liberation of a great many countries, uh, starting with uh, India, of course, in 1947, then the neighborhood of India right up to Indonesia, Malaysia, in Asia. And last but not the least, the great eruption of uh, freedom mm. movements in Africa. And you, in your view, what's uh, been India's role in this? Oh, India has been in the forefront of this. Absolutely in the forefront for two or three very obvious reasons. One, the leaders of the Indian freedom movement were very aware of the world outside people like uh, Gandhi, people like Nehru, they knew what was happening in the world outside and they were very active. In fact, it was the freedom of India which uh, set the pattern for freedom of a great many other countries. And as Vice President, I've traveled a good bit in Africa, East, West and Central and everywhere the same uh, compliment was paid that you were the flag bearer, you showed us the paths and we followed. And where do you think India is heading now? Oh, India is doing very well uh, technologically. Mm. We are uh, right up front uh, as far as modern technologies are concerned. You would have heard or read about the Indian uh, mission to the Mars space program. Mm. It's uh, one of the great success stories. We were able to do it at first shot and at a fraction of the cost which other space powers have incurred. Uh, you have served uh, for two terms, consecutive terms, and for that matter uh, it's, it's been unprecedented as uh, Vice President of uh, India. And, uh, uh, and more importantly, uh, you ha uh, you're a Muslim. And how do you see the relations between Muslims and uh, Hindus in India? And how has that really progressed over the years? Well, first thing first, uh, India has a Muslim population mm. on last count, uh, a little over 180, 85 million, mm. which makes India definitely the third, possibly the second largest 
uh, Muslim population in the world. I mean, the first is Indonesia. The mm. second could be either India or Pakistan or Pakistan or India. Mm. So Indian Islam and Muslims in India are not a new phenomenon. Mm. This is not like uh, what has happened in First World War II in uh, Europe, for example, mm -hmm. or United States or Canada. In, Muslims have been there for over a thousand years. Mm. And they've been part and parcel of Indian life. They have integrated well. And uh, they continue to be an important segment. They are 14.3% of the total population of India. But there may have been uh, some challenges over the years. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. The challenges have been there mm. all the time. The mm. challenges were starting with uh, the advent of the British mm. in the beginning of the 19th century, the process which was completed around the middle of the century. When, I mean, the British formally took over the rulership of India in all parts. So, and that meant, uh, you know, a strategic change, a cultural change, because the Muslim ruling class in many parts of India, not all parts, in many parts of India, suddenly found itself completely And isolated. do you see a bright prospects for a continuation of uh, uh, relatively peaceful coexistence, which really existed or featured? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mind you, Mm -hmm. India, with its population of 1.3 billion, yes, uh, huge population, mm -hmm. there are always some kind of social tensions or the other. Yeah. Uh, there may be economic tensions, there may be just uh, interpersonal tensions. Sometimes they take the form of uh, community tensions. Mm -hmm. But by and large, in terms of the Indian thought process mm -hmm. and governmental policies, mm -hmm. uh, the approach is to promote... Uh, cooperation to promote uh, conciliation where there is need for conciliation. But I suppose one thing which has really served India very well, it is its uh, democratic framework and uh, the political pluralism which really exists within uh, that framework. Absolutely. I think we can take uh, credit without being immodest mm. about having done it way back mm. 70 years ago. The constitution making started one year before the British left. That was 1946. They left in 47. We completed the making of the constitution by middle or end of 1949. Promulgated the constitution in January 1950. And since then, it has been the same constitution and the same institutional structure that was put in place. We've been through 16 general elections, innumerable state elections. Democracy has become almost part of the Indian DNA. So it's very important that politics is institutionalized in uh, India. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Um, it would be very remiss of, of me not to ask you a question about the state of relations between India and Pakistan. Ah. Um, uh, how do you see that the relationship is going now? Well, between neighbors, there are periods of uh, joy and there are periods of uh, sorrow. Uh, right now, uh, I would wish it to be different. I think we are going through a bad patch. Bad patch in the sense not of fighting, but of a great deal of tension in relations. Ultimately, it all boils down to one thing. We've been having trouble like so many other countries in the world, mm. having tr trouble for a variety of reasons, mm. of uh, people from coming across the border or being encouraged from across the border in acts which are unlawful. Terrorism is a phenomena which is, um, well, in its modern manifestation, mm. it's not a new phenomena. It's always been there. Uh, ancient times... Uh, we had a great political strategist, we call him the Machiavelli of ancient India, mm -hmm. um, Chanakya, who wrote a book mm -hmm. on statecraft called Artha Shastra. Mm -hmm. And he described terrorism as secret war. Mm -hmm. Now you mm -hmm. had in the Middle Ages in uh, Central Asia, mm -hmm. uh, the assassins. But uh, I suppose to uh, confront uh, terrorism, uh, a, there is a, a strong need for uh, cooperation between India and Pakistan? Well, there is need for cooperation, there mm. is need for contestation because, you see, uh, practical statecraft mm. always operates at multiple levels. Mm. There is a formal level, 
mm. in which everybody swears by the constitution, mm. uh, the charter of the United Nations. There are no two views about mm. it. Mm. But there are other levels at which countries operate and uh, India Pakistan are the only ones. Mm. It is true of every country. There mm. are subterranean levels where you try to drive the point home by mm. making the other person feel mm. uncomfortable. But do you see a viable resolution of the conflict between India and Pakistan? Mind you, the last war we fought was in uh, 1971. Yes. Uh, so, we've had a long period of peace. Mm. We've had lots of tensions, mm. but the communication has never really stopped. Even today, when there is no formal communication, mm. the certain agencies of the government continue to be in touch with each other to ensure that things don't go out of control. As my last question, uh, may I ask you, uh, what is your assessment or your general assessment of the Muslim world and uh, where the Muslim world is going from your perspective? The Muslim world is in chaos, mm. quite honestly. Mm. Uh, and when you say Muslim world, you mean there are two meanings which can be taken. One is Muslim countries or countries with uh, Muslim majorities. They can start from Morocco in the west, come all the way down to Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei in the east. Mm. Uh, the central portion, North Africa and uh, West Asia, people call it Middle East. In India, it has never made sense to us to call it Middle East because for us, mm. Middle East is beyond, uh, beyond Singapore. Mm -hmm. We call it West Asia, which is a geographical description. Mm. And uh, this region has been in turmoil. It has been in turmoil for a variety of reasons. It will take a little time to dilate on that. The fact is that it has a certain centrality with regard to the rest of the world and particularly with regard to the Western world. Mm. And because of that proximity and centrality, it has always been the target of Western political overtures starting with classical age of uh, European imperialism. And it has continued in different forms to this day. Uh, what do you think a country like Australia, uh, or what role a country like Australia can play in terms of really improving the relations uh, or the tense relations which at the moment exist uh, between uh, the Muslim domain, if I could talk, talk, talk about it in that sense, which is very pluralist, and uh, particularly the West? You see, the whole question is, are you sane or are you obsessed? Mm. There is a great deal of talk these days about, uh, you know, well, to use a current expression, Islamophobia, mm -hmm. because that's a counter question to what was said in West Asia as Islamism. Mm. Now, there's nothing new about either. Mm. Uh, Islam as a religion has been around for 15 centuries. Muslim people have been around. Most of the time, this is a history of peaceful living, peaceful cooperation. There have been periods of tension. You can go back to Crusades in West Asia. You can go back to post-colonial period. There have been times when uh, countries in West Asia have been seen as great allies of uh, Western powers, enemies of Eastern powers. There have been times when the position has been completely reversed. So it is more to do with geopolitics mm. rather than with religion. But do you think there is a need uh, for uh, a country like Australia to engage in certain foreign policy actions which could uh, really contribute to the improvement of relations uh, between the Muslim domain and uh, particularly the West? Yes, as long as uh, it is based on sound principles. Mm. Australia is a founding member of the United Nations, subscribes to all the, mm. uh, all the principles of the United Nations. But uh, sometimes you tend, you are also a member of various alliances. Some of those alliances have gone in different directions at different times. This morning's uh, Canberra Times carries an article talking about the horrendous mistake that uh, Australia made in uh, West Asia, particularly in relation to Iraq, mm. and saying that despite knowing now all the uh, consequences of that mistake, mm. 
uh, the matter has yet to be discussed publicly, politically. So, you know, the point is, what, where do you take your position? Mm. Do you want to be a member of an alliance, right or wrong? Or do you want to be a country in your own right, which you are, mm. uh, and make your own judgments? In India, we have always taken the view that uh, we will not be part of alliances. We'll be mm. friends with everybody. Mm. Uh, but we will not be part of alliances because being a member of an alliance in a formal sense means signing away your freedom to make your own judgments. Uh, we, had, we adopted that approach during the Cold War mm. with great benefit uh, mm. to ourselves and it was greatly appreciated. We continue to follow that approach today. Things have changed, the nature of uh, combinations has changed. But our approach is make your own judgments. Mm -hmm. Don't be swayed by judgments being made by other people elsewhere for other reasons. And of course India was a uh, founding member of the Non-Aligned Movement. For the same reason. Yeah. Non-Aligned Movement was not a military alliance. Mm -hmm. You know, the total military prowess of all the non-aligned countries put together mm. would not equal one major power. But it was a commitment principally of uh, newly independent nations mm. in uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America mm. to not to be goaded into mm. uh, an alliance for this reason or that reason but to make your own judgments and concentrate on your own priorities. Mm. And those priorities were what? Nation building priorities. Mm. Your Excellency, thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you very Many much, thanks. Professor Cycle, and great to see you again. Same here. All the best.